Uh, it is indeed an honour to be invited to be here uh, to launch the latest issue of the University of New South Wales Law Journal, especially on the occasion of its 40th anniversary. To those here tonight who have been involved in uh, editing the journal or who have published in it, I offer you an especially warm welcome. Uh, for those of you that haven't, I wonder if you could just sort of move and sit quietly in the back and not make a fuss. Um, we're not going to pay you any attention. I must begin, however, with some unwelcome news. I've been invited to address you for 30 minutes. Uh, it was not made clear whether or not this included footnotes. <laughs> but in accordance with accepted canons of construction, I've interpreted this generously to the speaker. I will treat my footnotes as endnotes, and I'll read them after the expiration of the half hour. Uh, I'm pleased that you're sitting, because I was otherwise going to offer you the uh, comforting words of my grandmother, who always used to say, I hope you're wearing comfortable shoes. Forty years is a very significant period of time. It's half the average span of a human life. And uh, I have here a footnote to the latest life tables of the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I can share the details with you later. Um, among other animals, only the rhinoceros, the elephant and the whale live longer. And somewhat unexpectedly, so too do the swan, the parrot and the goose. Biologists tell us that animals that live longest are those that guard most effectively against predation. And that is true also of law journals and is a theme to which I'll return in just a moment. An anniversary such as this invites us to think about life as it was at the birth of the journal in 1975. Politically, they were heady days. Australia was undergoing massive social change under the Whitlam Labor government. Today's Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, was just leaving high school. And tomorrow's Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, <laughs> was still studying arts law at Sydney University. More importantly, ABBA was topping the charts with Mamma Mia. Status quo was singing down, down, and we can never forgive them for inventing that tune, or Colesmeyer for mutating it into that most irritating jingle. Peter Weir's film Picnic at Hanging Rock was released to great acclaim, and television began broadcasting in colour. In the context of this university, the law school itself had been established only five years before, with the prominent appointment of Hal Wooten as its foundation dean. And it was on the cusp of graduating its first cohort of students. Within this short span, just the lifetime of a queen bee, the law school was ready to launch its flagship publication. In the foreword to the inaugural issue, the Chief Justice of New South Wales, Sir Lawrence Street, noted that the law school had already reached a level of maturity and gathered about it a sphere of influence that justified the production of its own journal. The contributors to that first issue set the tone for what was to come. There were no lightweights. They included the Chief Justice of Australia, Sir Garfield Barwick, the Commonwealth Attorney General, Kep Enderby, distinguished international and Australian academics, and, with a notable measure of egalitarianism, a final year law student. The articles reflected hot topics of the day. The Chief Justice wrote on environmental conservation, of which he was a great proponent. The Attorney General discussed sweeping reform to family law with its controversial abolition of no-fault divorce. And several authors considered competition law, also then in its infancy. In these immodest beginnings, you can see nascent practices that came to character characterise the journal as it unfurled. Contributors ranged from the loftiest heights of judicial office to the very turrets of the ivory tower, and to students who were knocking firmly but determinedly at the doors below. Their scholarly contributions challenged the social fabric and invited us to imagine a world in which law played a positive force in advancing us ever so incrementally on the path from our Neanderthal past to our post-human future. Evolutionary theory tells us that change is the very agent of adaptation and survival. And when one looks at the record of the past 40 years, it is clear 
that a key reason the journal has flourished has been its willingness to do things differently, differently from its own past and differently from others. There have, of course, been many changes in the legal sector over that period. Marked growth in the number of students, teachers and practitioners, increased legal specialisation, greater internationalisation in outlook, less demarcation between legal science and other social sciences, and increased professionalism within the academy. The journal has embraced these changes. Let me offer two examples from my own experience. After it had been operating for just six years, the journal decided to expand its output by publishing two issues each year, one of which would be a thematic issue. The foreword to the first of these proclaimed a keen awareness of the marked similarities among Australian law journals and the desire to do something different and particularly something with a cross-disciplinary focus. The subject chosen for the first thematic issue in 1981 was environmental regulation and thus began the practice each year of selecting a topic that would form the kernel around which legal and non-legal scholarship would crystallise on an important topic of public policy. Close at heel, there followed thematic issues on economic regulation, medicine and the law, and intellectual property. Another innovation of the day must now be viewed as somewhat quaint. Uh, dissatisfied with the idea of special content, the editors also wanted a special cover that would signal our difference from other law journals. We know that the forces of natural selection often favour animals with the brightest colours and the most elegant plumage. So not only did we want the covers to be in colour, but we wanted them lacquered so that they would gleam like the iridescent contents of what lay within. Now this was a tall order because it was expensive, but an indulgent dean granted our wish. And the coloured covers soon rolled off the press, green for the environmental issue, purple for medicine and the law, and an unbelievably expensive metallic cover for the intellectual property issue. I noticed it's one of the coloured covers that isn't there, and I think that because it must have been a collector's item. <laughs> I say our concern was quaint because who these days even knows what the cover of a journal looks like? Last week, I went to my university library in search of the early issues of the journal. Not surprisingly, they were not to be found on open shelving, but were sequestered in the bowels of our automated retrieval system. It turned out to be anything but automated. It took three librarians half a day to uncover 10 bound volumes. Excitedly, I thumbed through them, only to find to my consternation that the coloured covers had been wrenched off the issues for the binding of annual volumes. Whereas once these exciting covers seemed to soar through space like a Brancusi sculpture, now there was not even a trace of pixie dust. The advent of electronic access to journals has taken this phenomenon to a new plane. It has completely removed the occasions for heated debate among editorial staff about critical issues such as the colour wheel, colour harmony, and the aesthetics of analogous and complementary colour schemes. The introduction of thematic issues and glossy, issue, uh, glossy covers were just two innovations. The process has, of course, continued apace, and as we've already heard, um, the rest is history. In 1975, the journal ex uh, introduced the forum to provide an arena for debate on public uh, issues of public interest. And in 2013, the two annual issues expanded to three. And this year, as we've heard, it expands once again uh, to four issues per year. For all the innovations of the day, when I look back at the journal in its first decade, some aspects of its operations were quite primitive. First, we had to develop an in-house editorial style in the absence of an agreed standard, such as the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. That gave rise to endless disputation. It is true that punctuation can be a matter of great import. In her entertaining book, Eats, Shoots and Leaves, Lynn Truss notes that the printers of St Petersburg precipitated the first Russian Revolution in 1905 by striking in demand of the same rate of pay for punctuation marks 
as for letters of the alphabet. Our own opinions as editors were held with no less conviction, but were of somewhat more meagre significance. Secondly, our processes of peer review were rudimentary. This reflected our lineage as a student edited journal in the American law review tradition. In that model, clever, well-meaning, but essentially ignorant students, passed judgments on the considered labours of professional academic staff, thereby expediting the latter's path to fame or oblivion. Our form of peer review comprised finding an agreeable member of academic staff with a similar subject interest and asking them casually, usually in the corridor, what they thought of the manuscript. Their response was rarely a considered report, but a cursory yes or no. In time, the demands for greater professionalism made it necessary to bolster the journal's peer review processes, and this change uh, became important across the whole academy. <coughs> Thirdly, the type of review we conducted made us susceptible to favouritism in the selection of manuscripts for publication. There were two perils. One was the preference for the scholarly work of academic staff within the law school. In the early years, a significant portion of contributions were in-house. That is not to say they were unworthy, but the appearance was not salutary. The other peril was the fast tracking sometimes given to contributions from judges, presumably because it allowed the journal to bask in the warm glow of the judicial aura. Judges have made some excellent scholarly contributions to journals over the years, but the after dinner speech is usually not the finest example of their craft. My own brush with this issue arrived with a manuscript we had to consider from Michael Kirby who was then chairman of the Australian Law Reform Commission and was very soon to be appointed as president of the New South Wales Court of Appeal. The subject matter was breastfeeding and in particular the regulation of breast milk substitutes in developing countries in Africa. To be sure, it was not an after dinner speech and the topic was inherently important, but it was a peculiar choice of topic for that author. On the advice of our faculty advisor, we duly accepted it and published it. Only many years later did the full story emerge. This is what Justice Roddy Ma, his colleague on the Court of Appeal, later said of Justice Kirby. I quote, When I first came to the court, his favourite subject was breastfeeding. I do, not know, I do not now remember what his attitude to the subject was whether breastfeeding was a fundamental human right or the violation of a fundamental human right. Once he was invited to talk about it at a gathering of African chiefs, and it was only when he mounted the rostrum on which sat his principal hosts with their plumages unruffled and their nose bones polished that he realised what he was supposed to speak about was press freedom. The fourth aspect of our earlier practices that now calls for critical reflection is that there were insufficient safeguards against editorial error. Bear in mind that there was then no automatic, automated spell checking nor bibliographic management software and that some students were invited onto the editorial board with wanton disregard for their dyslexic tendencies. Now James, you very kindly said that you could find no errors but I'm about to fess up. <laughs> One painful episode is seared in my memory. George P. Smith II is an American scholar in health law and bioethics, and he was a long-standing friend of the late George Winterton. During one of his many sabbatical trips to UNSW, he contributed an article to the thematic issue on medicine and the law on the subject of the ethical issues raised by deep-freezing humans, cryogenics. With a mawkish nod to William Wordsworth, the title should have read, Intimations of Immortality, colon, Clones, Cryons and the Law. And in my dyslexic mind, that is exactly what it did say. In fact, what achieved immortality was my proofing error. And if you check volume six, which is available on display <laughs> at the back of the room, you will see clearly in black and white that it reads, and in fact has always read, clones, sirons, and the law. 
Now, as Catherine mentioned in her introduction, I had the privilege of joining the editorial board of the journal in the early 80s, and I stayed there for three years. We were given our own den in a remote corner of the old law school building. Without approval from anyone, one weekend we clandestinely painted the room a lurid pink. <laughs> My tastes haven't changed. It was the sort of colour that Dulux might call strawberry surprise or hot flamingo. It was not a secret we kept for long. Yet, for all our eccentricities, we were tolerated, even indulged. Apart from the hard work, which came in buckets, as you know, it was a time of personal flourishing. The intensity of life in room 1231 led to occasional enmities and the odd palace coup, but overwhelmingly, they were happy days. It spawned romances that led to two marriages, so be warned. It left us with lifelong friends, a keen appreciation of academic journals, and an unbridled enthusiasm for the peculiarities of English grammar. Fortified by this most rigorous training, I had the opportunity to test my mettle soon after leaving law school when I worked as Sir Anthony Mason's associate. Meticulously, I edited his draft judgments to correct his small foible, widely shared in the writing community, of confusing relative pronouns by using the non-defining relative pronoun which when the defining relative pronoun that was more appropriate. It is a testament to his good nature that he never objected to these precocious interventions, but it is also a testament to his self-assurance that he never desisted from his exasperating practice of using the wrong pronoun in the first place. If any of you are confused about the grammatically correct course, we can go through some worked examples later in the evening. <coughs> Alternatively, at your leisure, you can consult Fowler's Modern English Usage, which is strikingly clear on this point. And although my 1965 edition, which still adorns my shelf, may no longer qualify for the appellation of modern, it is comforting to know that Fowler's prequel, The King's English, published in 1908, makes exactly the same point with characteristic panache, suggesting his concern was not evanescent. Now, as soothing as these grammatical questions are, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the journal, there is a larger question at stake, which I would like to raise before pausing briefly for intermission. The question is, what is the point of law journals at all? This may appear to be an unnecessarily provocative question for a gathering of the converted, but if, as academics, we're not asking the hard questions, what's the point of our existence? The biggest pushback has come from the United States, where every aspect of the law review enterprise has been subjected to critical examination and re-examination and found wanting. The first shots were fired in 1936 by Fred Riddell, a crusty, sardonic and irreverent Yale law professor. In his famous article, Goodbye to Law Reviews, Riddell pithily summed it up in these terms. There are two things wrong with almost all legal writing. One is style, the other is content. That, I think, about covers the ground. Then, lurching forward a few decades, Abner Mikva, a US federal judge on the DC circuit, claimed that the use of footnotes was an abomination that had spread like a fungus. As one wit noted, the law review author may not assert so much as the sun rises in the east without citing Copernicus. Mikva's article, Goodbye to Footnotes, pleaded for legal writers and especially judges to go cold turkey in giving them up. Then, not to be outshone, Judge Richard Posner weighed in with a plea to abandon the Bible of US legal citation. You guessed it, his article is optimistically titled Goodbye to the Blue Book, which he described as a monstrous growth remote from the functional need for legal citation forms that serves only obscure needs of the legal culture and the student subculture. 
Now, on all these issues, there is a rich literature in the United States. But a cogent answer to the criticisms was provided, in my opinion, by our own Justice Kirby over a decade ago. Law journals contribute to the development of academic principle. They assist judges in deciding cases. And they provide, and I quote, fine training for good legal writing and editing. The editors of the UNSW Law Journal will benefit from that training for the rest of their careers. And the first fruits of their labors can be seen in the issue that is being launched today. Prolixity is a problem not only for law journals, but also, as you've discovered, for law journal launches. So let's move to the denouement and launch the latest issue. It sits here in the back of the room, I'm sure you've noticed, a silent sentinel. I encourage you in good time to pick it up and feel its heft, caress its unlacquered cover, smell its newly dried but environmentally friendly ink, Prize it open and you will see a bumper issue comprising 13 articles by 22 authors, spanning some 425 pages and 2,063 footnotes. Yes, 2,063. You'll be relieved to hear that I don't intend to summarise the author's contributions or predict their future impact. I note, however, with the pleasure known only to a true quant, that the issue is peppered with tables, graphs and images, signifying the important transformation of legal scholarship into a discipline that sits ever more comfortably alongside other social sciences. Have I read them all? Well, hell no. But to those authors who are present tonight, don't fret, hardly anyone will. <laughs> and so, with hearty congratulations to the authors who have penned those words, to the editors who have shaped them, into this fine issue and to the faculty that has supported them in their enterprise, volume 38, number one, is hereby launched. Thank you. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which this, the university is placed and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to all our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islands colleagues and students. Um, look, I think we've had enough of being nice about the journal for a while. I'm actually, I've got to be honest, I'm, I'm actually pretty fed up with the journal today. And I'll tell you why. Well, it's, firstly, it's, um, it's not because I've spent a fair bit of time dealing with a, an author who complained about, you know, the usual sort of arrogant academic who complained about these pesky, ignorant students who couldn't recognise the wonderful value of his work. I actually quite enjoy doing that, you know, you can do, <laughs> knocking them back. Secondly, it's not about the contributors to this issue. I'm going to be good tonight because I, I got into trouble at one of the launches last year when I, um, I quite inadvertently um, gravely offended one of the contributors by, I thought, offering some constructive criticism. <laughs> so I'm not going to say anything about the contributors tonight, including I'm not going to say anything about the regrettable views of one of the contributors, not in the article in this journal, thank God, uh, about torture or about the fact that he was the only Australian law dean who refused to sign a letter supporting Julian Triggs. It would be quite inappropriate to do that. Now, the, the reason I'm actually um, fed up with the journal today is, is I, I went through the same exercise that Brian did, which was that in coming tonight, I thought it would be good to just have a quick flick through some of the, 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 the back issue. So I started uh, looking at Ostley, which to Ostley's great credit has got every issue of the journal going back to 1975 available online. But I'm a bit like Brian, I think I'm, you know, I'm too set in my ways to think that's the right way to read stuff. So I, I went down to the library, and our law, law library at least, it's got them on the shelves, although to the discredit of the UNSW Law Library, it's missing part of the, one of the, first, the first, uh, first volumes. And of course the trouble was there, in what was supposed to be a really busy day for me, I was rushing around doing the usual meaningless things I spend my time doing, I found myself about three hours later sitting on the floor of the library still <laughs> looking through the, 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 the back issues of the journal. 
And the serious point I'm obviously making here is just the extraordinary quality of the, uh, the people who have been involved in the journal and of the, the work that has been published over the years. Um, the, the journal is closely linked to UNSW Law School. It's been said it was produced in the year that our first students graduated. It's published some key documents from the law school's history. Uh, some of the things that I was reading today were Hal Wooden's speech at the first graduation, um, Gerard Brennan's speech on the 25th anniversary of the founding of the law school, and Hal's two wonderful speeches uh, in connection with the, the Hal Wooden lecture, his living greatly in the law essays. The, the relationship between the Law Journal and the Law School has, has been a, a really important one. It's symbolic of what I see as being a, the broader culture of UNSW Law. So that relationship has not always been easy, but it's always been respectful and productive. It's always had students as the most important part of the Law, the law School. And it's been your journal. It's been the Students' Law Journal all the way through. The, to the extent that staff have been involved, it's been to advise and guide, but never to, to say what you should be doing. Um, as I said, I was really struck by the quality of the, the people involved when I looked through those issues today. Um, but first, I actually want to start by saying something which really, really pulled me up <clears throat> was the sadness of seeing a couple of names there of people who in, in recent years, of editors of the journal who suffered great sadness. Uh, one of them, Michael Sermay, who lost his, his wife, Danielle. And, and secondly, more, more recently, Paul Smith, whose, whose wife, Katrina Dawson, was one of the victims of that appalling event in, in Martin Place. And uh, I think that if we were going to, to do anything about acknowledging people at this 40th anniversary, I think those two people, ex-editors, really deserve it more than anybody. I was going to mention the quality of the contributors from early issues of the journal. Uh, Brian's already m talked about one year I picked out, which was 1975. But then 1978, I mean, he said, you know, they, they published a lot of stuff from people who were closely associated staff with the law school. Well, I mean, look, I've got some amazing colleagues today but if you look at the list from 1978, some of the people who were published then, Michael Kirby, Ron Sackville, Tony Blackshield, Garth Nettheim, Gillian Siegel and Robin Lansdowne, Pat O'Shane, Harry Whitmore, and not a member of staff, obviously, uh, W.M. Gummo. So there have been some wonderful people who've been involved. I note that the issue that Brian, um, the, sorry, the, the volume, the, the year that Brian was the editor. It included an article by one D.M. Gonski, modestly described as a solicitor of the Supreme Court. His editorial team also included a couple of uh, you know, real superstars from this, this law school, Lucy McCollum, Leslie Hitchens, now dean at UTS across the road. Sorry, Lucy McCollum, if people don't know, is judge of the Supreme Court in New South Wales. Leslie at, at uh, the uh, University of Technology, and Shimara Wakramaniaki, the, the, one of the superstars at Macquarie Bank. Um, more generally, the people who are in that list of editorial alumni, which is on, it's a great job the journal's done putting that list on, on your, your website, includes people who I see in leading positions around the world when I go around meeting alumni. And it really makes a point that I always make at, at, at launches where, when usually when I'm speaking to the people from the, the law firms who are there, which is that the, the Law Journal has always attracted the very best students in the law school. And it's a tradition that I've really tried to, to encourage and to, to, to help. You, you see the list of alumni from from the, the Law Journal over the years. And it just, I mean, I, there's far too many people for me to, to read out, but they are the most extraordinarily, extraordinary group of people. Almost everyone who I can think of who 
are the ones that you know I see now as being the 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 leaders of the law schools alumni are people who were also um, on the on the law journal back in their day. So I, I really finish this by really congratulating this year's and last year's editorial team who've been responsible for the launch of the, for, for the production of, of, of this new issue which is being launched today. Um, James Norton, the executive editor this year, and, uh, and Catherine Chan, you've both done a, a wonderful job and your, your job is to keep up a, a really proud and significant tradition and I've got absolutely no doubt that the editors of this year are going to go on to be amongst the, the stars that in a few years time we'll be looking back at another event like this. So uh, I think if I had a drink in my hand, I'd raise a toast to the, law, to the, to the UNSW Law Journal, but I'll just say happy birthday. So thanks everyone, congratulations. Thank